Welcome to the Fruity Knitting Podcast. This is episode 33. I'm Andrea. And I'm Andrew. We're really pleased to have you with us again this week. We've got a great show lined up, a lot of exciting guests. Yes. Andrea Maori is a really popular designer. She's best known for her Find Your Fade designs and her Brioche Alicious Shaw. We've got a really lovely interview with Andrea Maori to share with you today. Andrea lives in Michigan and we're going to go further north to Oslo, Norway to meet Marta, our guest on Knitters of the World, and yet further north to the world's northernmost national capital, Reykjavik, for our new segment, New Releases. Yep. So all that. We've also got a tutorial. Andrea has prepared a short tutorial on cutting and grafting your knitting, just in case you happen to make a mistake. And speaking of which... Madeline will be joining us briefly very soon <laughs> to give us an update on her work. But we will be starting off with my first contribution in Bring and Brag. So what we're looking at is my booster beanie, which I am wearing on this Yay. very warm winter, summer, summer day. day in Germany. <laughs> Even Germany has managed to turn on a really good summer this year. So... Andrew's sweating here. Look that way so they can see it side on. It fits him perfectly, just exactly the way he likes it, which is a snug fit. Yep. You can take it off now. I will take it off. (laughs) Um, So there's the hat. It's finished. As I mentioned last week or last episode, we did do a slight modification. You can see these pattern repeats here. We took out two of those that came out right as at the length that I wanted it for myself. That's that's sort of the preferred shape that I like for a hat. It also works out simply when you take out two rather than just one because the decreasing, you can keep using the original pattern. I think if you wanted to just take out one or if you want to take out three, you would have to mirror everything on the decreasing yeah. part. Um, the pattern is the Booster Beanie by Gudrun Johnson. Gudrun Johnson has produced this pattern as a part or as the free pattern for the Shetland Wool Week 2017. So if you want this pattern, you can go to shetlandwoolweek.com and sign up for their newsletter and you'll get a copy of this pattern. Um, this is my first Fair Isle project. Uh, I found it a really good project for that because it's quite simple. It's a geometric pattern, but it sort of comes out and looks really good, even though it is just geometric. The, the fact that it's geometric makes it easier to keep track of where you are. I still managed to make some mistakes, but that's okay. I was really good at going backwards as well. Um, And I really love the result. I think it's turned out really beautifully. Um, The colours are great. The the wool is taken, it's virtual yarns wool, so Alice Starmore wool, and it's leftovers from the um, Firebirds jumper that Andrea knitted for me last year. Yeah. Yeah. So I blocked it on a balloon. That's right. You blocked it on a (laughs) balloon. Andrea said the balloon was a really good substitute for my head. Um, I wasn't quite sure how to take that at first, but apparently she says it's just about the size and not about the contents. So, <laughs> yeah, so it's blocked out nicely, very round. It was quite interesting to do that because yeah. when you blow up a balloon and you think, oh, that's about the size of a human head, and then you measure it and you find actually it's way bigger than a human head, well, Andrew's head. <laughs> so I had to let some of it go out. And by the time I got the balloon to be the size that had the circumference of Andrew's head. It was a pretty small balloon. Yeah. I've got a very compact brain, so. (laughs) But it worked really well. It looks beautiful. little diversion about my head. (laughs) Um, Yeah, that's the beanie. It's finished. I really enjoyed it. I really recommend it. If you uh, haven't challenged yourself with um, Fair Isle, it's a perfect pattern for Go that. Go for it. Small, easy. The re- one of the reasons why it's so good is it's only a four-stitch repeat, which means that you don't have to worry about weaving in long or catching the long floats behind. So you could even try the two-handed uh, ferrule technique just very slowly um, and get used to working with two different colours and two different hands. You don't have to do two, two-handed technique, but um, it's a great pattern just to play with that and just get involved and, and, and try it out. It's small. You can get anything from your stash and any colours, almost pick them out with your eyes shut and they're going to come up with an interesting colour combination. Um, so you, if you're a bit nervous about picking colours or whatever, this is also a great hat for, for doing that. There's amazing different hats have come out. Yep. You can check it out on Instagram. Check, yeah, if you just do the hashtag Booster Beanie, then you'll see them all there. There are also recommended colours with the pattern Yeah. in the um, – Jamison and Smith yarns. Yeah. But yep. yeah. A nice, a nice um, feral yarn. Well done. Colour work yarn you want with it. So that's that. 
And while I'm here, yeah. let me show what I'm doing now. This is some woolen vines, wool that we were given by uh, one of our viewers, Jill in Perth. So thank you very much to Jill. Sent and this. hello, Jill. <laughs> hello to Jill. Um, Jill is a faithful fan of ours. Yes. Um, so Andrea has said that she would like a beanie of her own and um, we're looking at ni a nice chunky woolen winter type beanie. Um, so I'm just doing a swatch for this and um, just doing a basic pattern on it, a bit of a, a sort of squarey pattern with knits and pearls and nothing too fancy. Which I don't like. I thought I would no. just uh, design one myself that, that I liked. Yeah. I, d I wanted him to try out this pattern to see how it looked in the in the yarn. I don't like it that much. I think Andrew's ready for brioche. Brioche. Yes. So <laughs> Out of the fire, frying pan into the fire here, yes. I feel like. So just one colour brioche, but I think brioche would look really good with this yarn in, um, in a beanie. So yep. I'm going to try to do something like that. Just a very simple brioche knit stitch. Yeah. So. It's, I have to say it's interesting being your apprentice. <laughs> <laughs> I must, if, if I were doing my own education, if I were being autodidactic here, <laughs> yeah. I would probably take a more um, gradual path. But it's fun to be thrown yeah, in. It's fun. Oh, look, it's fine. It's fine. And you I manage just, so well, doesn't Yeah, I manage it? really well with, when you're there to help me when it goes wrong. That's what I always think is the hardest bit is when you do something wrong yeah. to then figure out how to get back to right. That's true. You know, I still find I'm getting slightly better at that, but I, I reckon that's really hard. It anyway, is. so yeah, brioche on the horizon. Yes. Okay, so you have That'll to go now. That'll get me sweating too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Andrew's going to say goodbye. I'm going to make way for Madeline. Madeline's coming. But yeah. I am allowed to come back. You're allowed to come back. Good. I'm always a bit scared. <laughs> In case she outdoes you. Yeah. <laughs> She's a pretty good act. She's pretty, yeah. <laughs> okay. Right, bye. This is our lovely daughter, Madeline. She occasionally joins us on the show. Welcome, Madeline. Hi. <laughs> I've said this before, but Madeline's just finished her final year's uh, exams at school. And in a few months' time, she's going to go to Australia to visit all our relatives. And in the meantime, she's been working to save up lots of money to do that. And so she's got a job as a waitress at a cafe. And mm -hmm. you've just got a job on a veggie stand at our local farmer's market. We've got a fantastic farmer's market in here in Offenbach. Yeah. So you were there this morning. So you're pretty tired now, aren't you? I'm very tired. I actually find it pretty, nearly more exhausting than waitressing for some reason. I don't know why. Um, but, yeah, it is still very fun because the people are super friendly and you're surrounded by delicious vegetables and fruit, which yeah. I love. Yeah. yeah. So what have you got to show us? I've got to show you um, something that I'm very excited about, which is my finished sleeve of my jumper. The jumper is called Atlantic. It's by Sarah Hatton. And you knit it in the Soft Jack DK yarn by Rowan. Yeah, and it's knitted in pieces from the bottom up and has raglan sleeves. I'll hold this up here. Yeah. You can put your arm down. Yeah. And you can see that I've done, well, yeah, I showed you the back piece as well. Um, I've done three pieces now from four pieces. And once I've done the right sleeve as well, then I'll be sewing everything together. Mum will be helping me with that because I've never done that before. So I'm excited to be learning something new. Yeah. Yeah. And you've got this, all the stripes matching. Yeah. Um, that's intended, of course. Um, that the stripes of the sleeve, they blend in with the stripes of the front and the back piece, of course, which makes it look extra elegant. Yeah. yeah. It's beautiful, Dals. Yeah. There's, I mean, this jumper, as simple as it really is, it's had quite a lot of stories to it and crises. Last episode, or not, well, the last episode that I appeared on, um, we pointed out a difference in length in the front and the back piece. <laughs> um, I knitted 20 rows too many in the front piece. And then, as we discussed last time, we were still going to think about whether we want to um, unravel We'll cut into the front piece and unravel 20 rows or cut into the back piece and add 20 rows. So we'd have the option of a short, a short version or a longer version. We start and decided for the short version, as you can see, and since mum's done her surgery on my jumper, it's matching. Yes, they look great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I did a short tutorial on how I, all the steps that I took to do the cutting, the unraveling and the grafting. 
and that's for you now, it's coming up. I didn't go into detail about the Kitchener stitch because most people know how to do that already and there's also some great tutorials on the, the um, Kitchener stitch but I did tell you some extra tricks and tips and also some memory tools to help you go through the process. So it's a really short tutorial, it's a fun tutorial, stay tuned and we'll see you on the other side. I have a front and a back piece of a jumper in front of me. The design is called Lantic by Sarah Hatton and it's been knitted by my daughter Madeline in the Rowan Sofiac DK yarn. The problem is the front piece has 20 more rows in this lower red section than the back piece and Madeline has also knitted the front piece at a slightly looser gauge than the back piece. She wants the front to match the back but she doesn't want to unpick anything so we're going to cut the front open horizontally, unravel some rows and then graft it back together again so it all matches. I have two long circular needles here that are a lot smaller than the needles that were used to knit the jumper. The jumper pieces were knitted with 4mm needles and these are about 2.5 and, and 2.75mm. And so that I don't have to worry about having live stitches, I'm going to insert my needles into the stitches of the two rows that I'm going to graft together before I even cut the knitting open. I'm going to make one of my grafting rows just above the gold rows here so that if there's any unevenness the eye won't see it as much. The other grafting row will be up here where this pin is. I'll then cut the knitting, unravel it and graft these two rows together. I've got the garment piece the right side up and I'm going to catch each stitch on this row here and put them the correct way onto my needle. Just so that you understand what I'm talking about, this just imagine this is a knit stitch and it's a V and here's another knit stitch of a slightly bigger gauge. <laughs> So this is a knit stitch and this is a knit stitch in the same row. You're going to take your needle and you're going to come from behind and come up through the center of the stitch like this. Then you're going to go down between the two stitches, so that's stitch one, that's stitch two, down between the two stitches like this and then up again through the center of the next stitch and you're just going to continue doing that to all of the stitches in the row. So now you've seen it in the big version, I'm going to show you on the knitting. I'm inserting my needle into the end stitch of the row from the back through the centre. Then I'm going down in between the two stitches and back up again through the centre of the next stitch. Then down in between the two stitches and back up again through the center of the next stitch. So that's what it's going to look like and I'm going to continue that all across the row. So I've now done that for the complete row and I'm pulling the stitches then onto the cable part of the needle like this. So then I turn the garment upside down and I go to where my pin is and that shows me this is the row that I want to pick up with my next needle and I'm doing the same thing. I'm going to come up the centre of the stitch, so the centre of the V and then go down in between the two stitches and up the centre of the V. Now because I've turned it upside down I'm going to be a half a stitch out but you still go up in between the two V's and then down in between the two stitches and up through the centre of the two V's again. I've finished threading through my second needle and I've turned the work back around to the, the right side, so the bottom's down here, and you'll notice that if you've got your, your knit stitch, the right leg of the V is now, that loop is now caught over the top of both of the cables. So when you follow one row of knit stitches up, the right leg will be there, will be caught over it, and then you follow it up to the next stitch, to the next uh, needle, and it's the same right leg is over it. So that means they're going to graft together really well. So the next thing to do is right in the center 
on the row underneath the top needle, I'll just pull out one of the legs and I'll snip it. And then I just use a darning needle that's pretty blunt and you can kind of un unravel it along here. The reason why I, I um, unpick here is that I can save all of this yarn. pieces are now ready to graft together. When you're ready to graft the two pieces together you want to start with positioning the stitches to be grafted on the two needles one in front of the other with the wrong sides together like this. You also want to have a long piece of yarn so that you can graft the whole row with the same yarn. I make mine approximately four times the width of the work. Afterwards, you're going to need to clean up your grafted row to make it tidy because you don't want it sloppier or tighter than the rows above or below. And it's easier to do that from both ends. So that's why you want to use a separate piece of yarn and not the yarn that's attached to your knitting. So you're going to do something different on the first stitches and on the last stitches, but all the stitches in between you're going to do the same rhythm for down the whole row. And you want to keep it really loose. Don't pull it tight. It's much easier to clean up the, the row and make it tidy from a loose stitch than it is from, from an over tight stitch. I'm nearly at the end of my row of grafting. You can see I've done all of that there. And you can sometimes go a little bit crazy trying to remember was I knitting on or purling off or what was I doing. So there is a memory aid that you can remember. Always think that you're working two stitches at a time. So you're working two stitches on the front needle, needle one, and two stitches on the back needle, needle two. So you've got two stitches here and they're both knit stitches. And the first stitch will always set the direction. So because it's a knit stitch, you know you're going to knit. Okay, now the first stitches on each needle you're going to pull off. And the second ones you're going to work them, but you're going to leave them on. So when you've got two knit stitches in front of you, you know it has to be a knit because it's the first one is a knit, knit so it's setting the direction. So knit, and it's a first stitch, so it comes off knit off and then you have to do the opposite on the second stitch purl on now it whoops and you keep the, the the yarn always underneath the two needles now we're on the second needle and if you look at it this direction we they're both purl stitches you've got two bumps so the first stitch always sets a direction so we know that we have to purl it and it's also the first stitch so it comes off so it's a purl off then the second stitch we have to do the opposite. So we're going to knit on, knit off, purl on, purl off, knit on. That's my grafting row here and you can see it's a little bit bigger than the rows above and below. That means you start in the middle and this is the part that you have to be really patient with and you systematically just tidy it up a few stitches at a time with the end of your needle. I can see like see those three stitches now they're sitting nice and neat. So I'll go along and do it in this direction towards this thread and then I'll do it in this direction towards that thread. So here we have the front and the back and now they perfectly match and you can't tell there's been some surgery. <laughs> My name is Smarta 
I'm uh, 36 years old and I live in Oslo, the capital of Norway. I live here with my husband and my two-month-old uh, daughter. Um, I love to knit and I knit a lot. And um, uh, one of my favorite things when it comes to knitting is the knitting with colors. And uh, I have found a great inspiration in the designer and artist K Facet, which I've knitted uh, several um, designs uh, uh, inspired by him. I would like to show you some of them. Uh, and the, the first one I've, uh, uh, you'll see here. Uh, this is uh, uh, an ins inspiration from an early design he designed in uh, the 80s. It's from this book uh, with the title K Facet Glorious Knitting. Uh, you can see that he plays a lot with stripes and colors. Uh, when it comes to uh, being creative, it's uh, about uh, choosing uh, one's own colors and color combinations and having fun. The second uh, design I want to show you is this sweater. Um, this is a design that I have um, created myself. But the um, uh, main motive, also the pattern on the front uh, uh, of the sweater is uh, from uh, this book, uh, K Facet's Pattern Library. It's a collection of um, 190 exquisite patterns uh, drawn by K Facet. Uh, when I created this uh, sweater, I used the um, technique, knitting technique, in Tarsia, uh, which I love to do. Um, it's so intricate and gives so many possibilities on how to uh, uh, make uh, uh, patterns and using colors. This design uh, started as a knitting swatch. Uh, I've knitted a lot of knitting swatches and uh, find them uh, really fascinating. I liked the swatch uh, so much that I wanted it as a motive on a poncho sweater. Uh, and this is the result. Uh, I chose a really vibrant orange color for the design and I like it really uh, much. Uh, it's also very nice to wear, uh, warm and uh, quite special. <laughs> this design is also um, a bit uh, inspired by K Facet, by his design powder puff. But I've uh, written the, the pattern myself and made the um, the circles uh, larger and uh, also uh, made a design that is uh, simpler than uh, what you would um, uh, associate with K facet designs. This is also a, a poncho sweater. I also made a matching hat for this uh, this winter uh, design. Uh, perfect in uh, Norwegian winters. I told you that I love to knit uh, knitting swatches and uh, this is a result uh, out of it. I knitted a lot of uh, uh, patches and I decided to make a garment out of it. It was a bit difficult to um, uh, find out how to piece it together but uh, um, it, uh, it went well. <laughs> Uh, I think it's a showpiece. Uh, 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 several of the patterns is uh, from uh, this book. Uh, it's um, a book uh, titled A Treasury of Knitting Patterns by Barbara G. Walker. She has collected uh, uh, hundreds of uh, knitting uh, patterns. Uh, and it's uh, quite fascinating to, to read about them and uh, knit them as well. I also like to spin a uh, hand spin yarn. This is a, a green multicolored Corridale. This is a hand spin Tusa silk. Uh, this is a green uh, colored Corridale. This is a Norwegian C1 quality wool. And uh, this is a uh, 
rainbow colored English Leicester fibers. Marta from Oslo, Norway. Um, Marta is obviously a huge fan of Kate Facet and uh, with all her uh, Kate Facet inspired designs, it was great that she did actually get to meet him in person. So Yeah, absolutely. And didn't she look gorgeous in her traditional costume, which we think is called a bunad. Well, that's how you, we know how to write it, but not quite sure how to say it, but yeah. I think it's bunad. And she was, the footage that you saw of Marta in her costume was taken on the 17th of May, which is the Norwegian National Day, which apparently is a really big deal in Norway. It commemorates the signing of the constitution, which happened on the 17th of May in 1814. Yeah. Yeah. And um, people take uh, the opportunity to show off their national costumes which come apparently, because I was reading up about this, they come in a great range of styles and colours because they represent the um, where your ancestral family comes from. Yeah. To me it sounded like the, um, the tartans in Scotland for yeah. the clans, different styles for different families. Yeah, but these would all be Viking families, that's Viking right. clans. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I really enjoyed having the contribution from Norway. That's yeah. that's one place that we really should go one day. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Marty. Your knitting is really gorgeous and you looked gorgeous in your costume and it was really lovely to see you knitting in your costume. Sewing has been featuring a lot on the podcast lately while I've been giving my arms a rest. I will be bringing back more knitting soon, very soon, and then I won't be doing so much sewing. Dol, just before you go on, yes. talking about bringing back knitting, this is actually a piece of your knitting work, isn't it? Yes. yes. Do you want to show it this that? Okay, I did I actually... Did notice, yeah. I did notice. You're looking pretty hot today, Dol. Am I? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, you generally are, but... <laughs> Thank you. Stand up and show us. Okay. So it's pretty lacy. It's actually see-through. I can notice just here. <laughs> well, it's a very hot day, so it's good to have something with a little bit of I'm, air conditioning. Yeah, I'm impressed that you can actually wear one of your knitted pieces on a day like today. Yeah, I actually, actually showed this top a, a year ago on the episode, and I've knitted this many years ago, maybe five years ago, five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me exactly where the pattern comes from. I think it was from a Filati Italian magazine. Yeah. But it was a bottom-up construction with a simple shell pattern and then the yoke is in stocking stitch. And it's very flattering, very easy design. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I reckon it's really um, – it is certainly flattering, Dales. Thank you. I'll have a look in the show <laughs> notes because I can imagine people want to know – where the pattern is. But they may not be able to buy the magazine. That's a bit no. tricky, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, I'll look at the show notes and try to find it and I'll put a link in there. Yeah. Fruityknitting.com. Fruityknitting.com, exactly. All the show notes for all of our guests and everything to do with the show is Lots there. Of... So go and visit there. Yeah. Anyway, you were talking about I was talking about sewing. Tilly and the buttons. Well, I was about to talk about Tilly and the buttons. I'm quite excited about her designs. Last uh, episode, I showed you a dress that I sewed for Madeline. Here's a picture of it. It's a great design. She loves it. I was very happy with it. And I had just enough material left over to make a skirt for her from Tilly and the Buttons. So this is the skirt I've just made. It's called the Ariel skirt here. It's a pencil skirt that can be made as a mini skirt or as a knee length skirt. It's very flattering. What I think is particularly flattering about this design is that it has a very high waistline that's figure hugging um, and it's just unusual and and it's got these two lovely darts. Maybe you can hold. Yep, just a sec. Can't drop my stitch towel. So. so it has two long darts at the front that really go quite long and then two long darts at the back here. Okay, and that is, makes it very flattering on the figure. Um, yeah, so it comes, there's instructions to make it lined or unlined. I decided to make the unlined version mainly because 
it has such, my material has such a big stretch to it and I couldn't find what I didn't have and I didn't have time to go looking for lining that is stretchy. You can get lining that is stretchy but um, I didn't have any so I thought I'll just make it unlined um, and I'm going to show you some pictures of Madeline in it. So the, the skirt itself is a very easy sew um, except for the buttonholes. They totally tripped me up. I did a lot of practicing and no matter what I did, my buttonholes looked like a dog's breakfast. So I tried, I think it was because my material is very stretchy and the buttonholes themselves lie horizontally like this. So I would do sew the buttonhole, it looked all right, and then I would cut it open and it would pucker and just look sloppy and awful. So then I tried to iron on some interfacing to make the fabric lose its stretch, uh, stretch and be a little bit stiffer. And that was a little bit better, but it still puckered. And then what I also did was got some fine white cord and sewed the buttonhole over the top of the white cord, which is also another technique to do. And I'll try to insert a picture here of some of the examples of my practicing. And when I did the buttonhole over the white cord, it looked beautiful and neat until I cut it open. And I think you'll see one version of a neat buttonhole and then another version of a puckered but buttonhole. And that's this uh, put buttonhole that did look neat until I cut it open. So, oh, I was so how did, worried. How did you cut it open? With an unpicker, but you, you just... There's a, there's a, you, you put the unpicker in and put it out so you're not going to cut in the wrong place and then slowly cut it little section by section. Okay. But just because the, the fabric still had stretch in it, it puckered it. And everything else about yeah. the dress was pristine and neat and crisp and I was really worried about wrecking the whole thing with ugly buttonholes and Madeline was on my back saying, Mom, don't, don't wreck the really skirt. <laughs> well, Dulce, I've got to give you, give you praise for actually trying it out on a scrap of fabric. I tried it out many times. I know, I know, but you might have just tried it out on the skirt. Oh, I wouldn't do that. That would have been sad. <laughs> well. I wouldn't do that. So in the end, what I decided to do is sew these buttons on, and I'm very happy with the buttons I was able to buy. I think they match the skirt beautifully. So there's yep. six lovely buttons along the side. I sewed them on the outside as decoration, and then I've used, it's like a, <laughs> it's a little bit like a strip skirt, isn't it? <laughs> I shouldn't not familiar say that with here. That, that <laughs> You're not familiar right. with that. <laughs> Okay, this is a family program. Yeah. <laughs> so I've, I've used press studs, and unfortunately, I know press studs is a cheating and it's not a good solution, and I haven't solved my problem, which irritates me, but I just really didn't want to wreck the skirt by putting ugly buttonholes on. And you did Google this and just didn't find it. I Googled it, but I think, I think it's a material somehow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I was thinking about it. You said the buttonholes are horizontal. They have to be horizontal so that the button catches in the corner of the buttonhole. You couldn't make the buttonholes like that because they would gape. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. You're a good so, thinker. <laughs> yeah. No, well, I was thinking because you said it was horizontal and I was just thinking. Yeah. So it's, it seems to be a problem when the, the stretch is in the line of the buttonhole. Yeah, but you can do it because you do get stretchy dresses with buttonholes. That's what I'm thinking. There must be a solution. There is a solution, but I didn't want to wait any longer. I wanted yep. to get the dress done. Um, and I know that press studs will mean that the dress material will wear out around the area where the, the press stud is because of the constant pulling it open. But it, it's all right. At least <laughs> I just want Madeline to wear it. Madeline sewed on the press studs, which was a really good thing for her to do because up to that point she hadn't even sewn on a buttonhole, so it was good for her a to learn that. Dolls. A button. I've got buttonholes on my brain, yeah. <laughs> dreaming about them. And that's a challenge in itself because you have to make sure that it's like, that you sew the, the press studs exactly in the right position so that the material will lie flat when done up. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a success. Yeah, I think Madeline thinks it's a success too. She loves it. She took a picture of herself in it and Instagrammed it and one of her friends immediately wrote back and saying, I love your skirt. Where did you get it? I want to buy one. And she said, my mum made it for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of praise you want to get. 
a couple of weeks ago when we were hiking in the woods and also filming for our last extreme knitting segment, we noticed that there were a lot of paragliders in the air amongst us. So up above where we were walking, we continued up the wall uh, up the hill where we were going and we came across their launching place and we could see there was a great group of people there all preparing their paragliding stuff yeah. and preparing to take off themselves. It was so exciting to see them take off. I've never been so close to them before. So we decided to film a two minute footage for you. And if you look closely, you'll see the instructor with a 12 year old girl in tandem taking off together. This was her first flight. And as soon as they were airborne, it, there was a great applause underneath because it was her family and friends. It was really exciting. It's really beautiful, peaceful footage accompanied by lovely music. It's only two minutes, so enjoy it. So the top of the, the bodice of the dress was knit in a raglan fashion, just top down regularly. And I did the neckline afterwards just by doing some simple ruching. It has a lot of built-in shaping with four darts on either side, just to make sure that it comes in at the waist really quickly to make it a really form-fitting garment. The, the skirt on the other hand, I knit from the bottom up. So it's kind of like a big sandwich that meets at the middle. So I started with the fur aisle patterning at the bottom, which I was inspired by some filet crochet curtains I found online. And this I used to represent Reykjavik, which is where I live and was married. So I, let, I like to start at the bottom when I'm making a skirt so that we have the largest stitch count when we have the largest amount of enthusiasm. So there's just a thing in my mind that says, if we're decreasing, it goes faster than when we're increasing. So as I had the most 
enthusiasm. I knit through all of the spare aisle of these houses that go all the way around. And it's a large, it's a semi-circle skirt. It's not quite a true circle skirt. The pattern does include a larger size, so if you want it to be a little bit fuller, but when you put a crinoline underneath, this is plenty of skirt and plenty of knitting. So as I said, we're decreasing upwards, and at the waist, I threw in two rows of knitting on smaller needles just to create a tighter fabric so that the seaming was really clean. And I think that really helps to create a defined line with a three needle bind off to, to connect the two pieces. The yarn I used for this piece is the Chameleon Sock from Indigo Dragonfly based out of Canada. It is a cashmere silk merino blend where two of the plies are the cashmere merino blend and one of the plies is the silk. So I find that really adds a luminescence and a lot of drape to the piece. The yarn I used for the houses is Classic Elite Yarns Fresco. It's an alpaca angora blend and it's really lovely and fuzzy and it does pill quite a bit, but it looks really nice to create a nice textured effect on the houses. The, both of those yarns are a fingering weight, so this does involve a lot of knitting. I used six skeins of 600 gram skeins of the chameleon sock for the body and the skirt and 250 gram skeins for, of the fresco for the bottom. So it is a little bit of a, it's a lot of knit. You have to know what you're getting into. There's a reason I didn't add sleeves. All this to say, house dressing is a very rewarding knit. It may be a long time coming, but once you bind off, it just feels great and you will only hear good things about your finished product. Thank you so much. Chantal's wedding dress is so original. I love the fact that she was able to create, uh, design and make the, the dress for her very special occasion, obviously. I also love the design itself. I think the cityscape of Reykjavik around the edge is really beautiful. Um, Super cool. Yeah. Super, super cool. And it's a really flattering shape with the, the fitted bodice and the full skirt. And I totally love the colour. When I first saw the design, I was so excited about it. And I thought we have to include it in the new releases. So that was great. Yeah, yeah, I loved it too. Um, we are due to announce the winners of our lace garment and hap cowl. And that's a really exciting thing because we have had so many amazing entries just Really, really incredible, the, the stuff that's come up there. Stunning knitting. If you haven't gone and seen the thread, just go and have a look at it because it's just some beautiful things yeah. in there. Yeah, we don't want to rush through that. I and mean, we do have a very full program today. So what we've decided to do is have a separate video just for the, the finishing of that cowl. Um, so that will come out in a couple of days from now. Keep an eye out for that. We would also like to remind you to get your selfies in for our cow collage. This is something that we really love to do. It's a great celebration for the end of the cow. So check out the instructions for how to do that on the finished objects thread on Ravelry. Um, the last bit of news is we did have our live event for our Shetland patrons last week. Our guest was Anne Budd. Um, as you would expect with Anne Budd, it was a really lovely evening. She is an absolutely lovely person. I like her a lot. Um, she is also carrying a wealth of um, knitting experience and knowledge and a great ability to communicate that and share it. So we had a really great time, a lot of ans questions, questions answered, a lot of good discussions there. The audio podcast of that event is available on Patreon, so you can check that out there. And we're also excited to say that the live guest for, or the, the guest for the live event for August will be Carson Demers, who we interviewed in episode 31. And he's the author of the newly released book, Knitting Comfortably, The Ergonomics of Hand Knitting. So that's really exciting and something to look yeah. forward to. Yeah, different, but a very important topic. Yes. As we know too well. Yes. <laughs> We would like to say thank you to all of our patrons for your financial support. It enables us to keep producing the program and we really love to do that. Yeah, this is my full-time work now and surprisingly it does take that much time to regularly put on a content-rich program. We are independent, we don't receive financial support from advertising or sponsorship and you can become a patron for the cost of a couple of coffees per month. So we do ask you, if you particularly 
look forward to our program coming out to please become a patron and thank you. So, Andrea, I think we're up to the interview. Yes, we are. I really enjoyed interviewing Andrea Maori. She is hardworking, um, down to earth, enthusiastic. Uh, she's a relatively new designer, but I think she's got a lot of drive and a lot of uh, dedication, and she's got uh, humility, which means that she's going to constantly be developing her designs and developing her work, which I think is great. So, enjoy the interview, um, and we'll see you in two weeks' time. Yeah, if you're a new viewer, do um, please subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the next episode. Also, the the cow. Yes, the cow annou announcements, announcements will, will be coming, coming up shortly. Up. Um, yeah, and we'll see you in the next episode in two weeks' time. Thank you very much for watching. Bye. Bye. <laughs>
Yeah, absolutely. So even just from the way you learn the fundamentals in all of these different things. So when it comes to cooking and baking, you learn how to measure and, you know, what a teaspoon is and how different things affect each other. And you kind of get the skeleton of it. And same with being a hairdresser. You learn you have to hold the hair at this angle or if you mix these chemicals together, it's going to turn somebody's hair these colors. And so you get these basics down and then from there is where creative creativity comes into play and you can really think outside the box and I think I always had the drive to do that so when I was a pastry chef I would focus on vegan and allergen free baking because I always wanted everyone to be able to enjoy it and then with cutting hair I was kind of got known as the person who will shave half your head and carve a cool design into your hair. And so with knitting and knitwear design, I think that my previous jobs really gave me the work ethic and the multitasking and all of these things that came into play, even the dexterity with my hands. But I also helped prepare me for, okay, I know how to knit. I know how to purl. I know these basics. And now I'm going to use those to hopefully create, either put a new twist on something or create something brand new that's never been before. But having a craft business means that you have to know a lot more than just knitting and designing. Like that's a lot in itself. So apart from continuously developing those skills, what else have you had to learn to keep your business going or get your business started? Or have you been able to use family and friends for assistance in this? Yeah, so it was a huge learning curve. Um, even in my early 20s when I was really getting into knitting, I would kind of look for information like, how do people make this a job? Like, could I do this? So before I even went to culinary school or learned how to be a hairdresser, I there was that curiosity, could I make knitting my job? But to be honest, it was pretty discouraging. I, I couldn't find much. And what I did find didn't seem super positive or optimistic. Yeah. It was kind of like, good luck. Maybe you can make this work. So it, that's why I kind of went to the wayside for all those years in my early 20s. And um, then when I finally was like, you know what? I There's something I want to make. And I'm just going to make it. And maybe somebody else will want to make it too. And so I already had the skills of writing recipes and things like that. And writing patterns is very similar. You know, you have your variations yeah. and your glossary. So I could put all those into it. And then I was really lucky to be starting at a time when Ravelry was already there and so established. And it really helped me figure out, like, okay, this is how... I put a pattern out into the world. I mean, they really give you everything you need. And then from there, it was all just trial and error and troubleshooting. Um, and I do I do everything myself, my website, everything I do myself, um, except for my photography. And I'm really lucky that I have my husband, who's an amazing photographer. He actually, his best friend went to school for it, and they worked on cruise ships together. So he got a lot of great tips on how to take really good photos. And I think just his natural aptitude for it has been really beneficial to me. <laughs> and now he even does all the editing and everything. So that's huge help because it's very time consuming. Um, so he's been my emotional support and also my photographer. And that's been huge. And with how quickly my business has expanded. Yeah, that's so important photography, isn't it, for presenting yeah. your designs? Yeah, it's like I sell something that people need those beautiful images to be drawn to it. And what about your website? Was that natural for you to do all of that kind of work and, and sort of working with Instagram? Is that kind of a natural thing or did you have to learn extra? Yeah, so Instagram was really kind of gaining speed in the beginning of when I started doing this. Um, so I was already posting lots of knitting pictures on there because that was my passion. So that, again, felt pretty natural. I didn't feel like I had to really learn anything. I tend to feel like if I just follow my heart, I'm like, if this is something I'm really loving, I love this image, I want to share it, it seems to be well received. Uh, my website Thankfully now there's, I use Squarespace and there's sites like that that make it really easy to build your own website. Um, so I had to troubleshoot and figure things out and it took some hours, but um, it's pretty easy now. I mean, everything, all the information you need, you can Google. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, but it's, yeah, it's all been a learning curve for sure. 
And it's also time consuming at first, isn't it? When you have to learn everything from scratch. Yeah, yeah, very time consuming. And it's hard because when your business is already starting to pick up speed like that, you already feel like you're kind of scrambling to stay ahead of it all. So sometimes it's hard for me to slow down and say, well, I've got to learn this to do it properly. So I, I have to take this time. And that can be kind of challenging. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about your design aesthetic. So when you're starting a design, do you like to go first of all as a to your own reference your own personal reference of a personal style that you like to wear or what suits your body type even or I mean you're known for working with brioche but is there other techniques that you like to incorporate like uh, cables or stranded or lace and also what other designers are there that have particularly inspired you with their aesthetic I am very drawn to brioche and um, really I'm drawn to texture. So I love one of my favorites that I use in a lot of my patterns is broken stockinette. So I just twist every other row of stitches and um, I love to play with some cables and um, a little bit of lace here and there, a little bit of color work. So I really like to play with it all. I definitely think there's the things I come back to. Um, I like geometric shapes a lot, arrows and chevrons and um, some of those kind of angular shapes within a softer fabric. Um, and I, I find that if I stick to what I love in the moment, something that's drawing me in, whether it be a shape or a silhouette or actually um, doing a shape like a cable or something in whatever it is I'm knitting, if I kind of just go with that, I enjoy it so much while I knit it and I think that my heart really ends up in it and other people can see that and seem to be drawn to it as well. So I don't focus too heavily on whatever may be trendy at the time. I kind of just try to stick with what I really love and um, and that tends to be kind of like my bread and butter things. So like feather and fan lace, a little bit of brioche. I really love garter stitch. So some of those things end up popping into my work again and again. Um, and as far as influence of other designers, early on when I was living in New Zealand and really getting into knitting, Nora Gone had just put out Knitting Nature. And that just blew my mind, um, the way she constructs things and could put these shapes together. And other people like Jared Flood is so um, tidy. Everything seems very precise. And then you have someone like Stephen West who throws all the rules out the window. So I think within my own work, I'm always doing this. Like there's a lot of balance happening. So I always have a brioche project and then I always have a stockinette project and something really complicated, something simple, something really bright and colorful and speckly, and then something really neutral and woolly, maybe undyed or plant dyed. And I find that I just try to avoid any labels on myself so that I can just kind of oscillate around. And then I tend to find my happy place, like a little over here, a little over here. And my own style seems to spring from that. It's really hard for me to define, I think, because I avoid that, like those restrictions. Yeah. But then when I take a look at my portfolio, I'm like, oh, I guess there is like, you know, a theme there, an aesthetic there. <laughs> so does that mean that you're often designing multiple uh, projects at the same time? Or do you get quite excited about one and that takes over? I am always designing multiple things at one time. You know, right now I'm ready to cast on three new sweaters <laughs> and I've got two shawls on my needles. And um, so, yeah, I'm definitely not a monogamous knitter. I have a lot of projects going at once because I think it's it's like I have this deep need for balance and I do that by um, playing around with different things. Yeah. And it doesn't get confusing for you? Mm -hmm. No. no. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I think you could almost tie it back to being like a baker or a hairdresser, you, okay, you know, in yes. both of those professions, you really have to bounce around. So your brain's all over the place, but you can't let the cookies burn, but you can't just stand there waiting in front of the oven. So yeah, you got to multitask. <laughs> that's a really good description, actually. Yeah. I mean, for some people, I think they might get a little bit anxious having sure, so many things absolutely. at once, but it really yeah. is a personality thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you should just stay true to what that is for you as an individual, I think. Yeah, cool. So when you started designing, your first designs were accessories and shawls, which is a really great way to get started with designing because you don't have to worry about um, fitting for different body types with garments or grading sizes and things. But since then, you have been 
designing garments and you've recently got a gorgeous design for Brooklyn Tweed that's this oversized cardigan, Ronan. Um, so talk to us about the learning curve for you because you would have to have learned a fair bit of technical knowledge on how to fit different body types and grey different constructions. Yeah, so what's it been like for you? Yeah, so it's definitely been a huge learning process. I had knit a lot of sweaters before ever attempting to design one. So I think I had a good foundation of what went into that. Um, but every sweater is so unique. I mean, I've even done similar shaping, but with a different weight of yarn. And it's amazing how much that alone changes the pattern. So yeah, it's I always start with kind of a sketch and then I go from there. But pencil and paper, you can do anything. You know, you can draw anything. So with Ronan, I drew this cardigan. I was like, oh my gosh, I love this so much. I can't wait to translate this onto my needles. And then it came time to do that. And I was like, how am I going to do this? And so I'm definitely a huge swatcher and not just to get gauge, but to try out shaping and everything. I'm very, I know some people, some designers can write their whole pattern and then knit their sample from it. And I wish my brain worked that way, but it doesn't. So I'm very like, I have my computer right here. I have all my reference books over here, lots of swatches over here. And I just try out prototypes and it's all trial and error. And I'm see, does this work? Do I like how this looks? Lazed? Can I adjust this? And I tend to be a little obsessive. So I'll, if something's not right, I've got to go back and fix it. So where a shawl or a hat or another pattern like that, I can bust out pretty quick. A sweater will take me a few months because I really, it's a puzzle for me and it really pushes me out of my comfort zone, uh, which is incredibly gratifying. Because once you do it, you know, Ronan looks exactly like my sketch and I'm still like, wow, I can't believe it really went from that pencil and paper to a real life sweater and it's so cool. Yeah, yeah, it's a gorgeous design. It looks great. Yeah, thanks, so it's got these long raglan, raglan uh, sleeve shaping, which is really great, and the curved pockets. Yeah, yeah. So the curved pockets alone were really a challenge because I did that shawl collar and brioche, and I was the shaping happens on different sides of the fabric, and so I had to do different decreases, but to mimic them perfectly, it was actually really challenging. And at one point, I was like. Maybe I just won't curve them. And Brooklyn Tweed was like, oh, no, we really like the curves. I was like, oh, yeah. no. <laughs> I, ha like, I have to figure this out. So there's, I have all these curved swatches in my big pile of, um, you know, and I figured it out. And even more rewarding because there was a point where I wanted to be like, scrap this. It's too hard. And then I had to push through. And that was really cool to do that. And it's really important to me that sweaters I design fit people well. And, um, you know, as a woman, I've had some pretty big body image issues. So that's, it's a lot of pressure to be like, okay, I want, I want people to wear this and to feel really good about themselves in it. And so, um, yeah, sweater design is like a whole other beast that is really exciting. Yeah. yeah. Well, good for you for pushing through because the curved brioche, um, cuff on it is really gorgeous. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about uh, yarn and fibres now. So it's really important, as you know, to pick the right kind of fibre for the right kind of construction or project. And even different types of fleeces are better suited for certain kinds of garments and things. So talk to us about what you've learned about that. And do you have a favourite fibre or yarn that you like to work with or, or even blend? I am definitely wool all the way. I love working with wool. Um, plant fibers tend to be a little hard on my hands. So if I am using a plant fiber like linen or cotton, even those I prefer to have a little bit of wool blended in with them because I think it helps with the elasticity. Um, wool to me is just magical. I went to a sheep show when I lived in New Zealand and I saw all these different breeds and it was just so cool. And talking, you know, having our, the farmers tell us about the different breeds. And then even Elizabeth Zimmerman has this story. She talks about her husband wearing his wool socks into a pond to get their dog. And he came home and his feet were still warm because the wool it wicks moisture away from us and it's self-cleaning with its lanolin. And so that's definitely my happy place. Um, I think it's really important if you're you know, big topic right now is like superwash versus non-superwash. And I use both, but I do find superwash loses some elasticity. So 
that's totally fine for something like a shawl because you want this drape. You want to be able to wrap it around you and have some flow. But something with a sweater, I want to know that so I can be very careful with my gauge. And I really want to block that gauge swatch because it's going to lose some elasticity. So if I do a brioche hat and superwash and I block it, it's just going to turn into a potato sack on my head. So just having the knowledge about, okay, this is what's going to happen. And swatching and blocking that swatch because that's your best window into what's going to happen um, I just think is really important uh, yeah that's a good answer okay and going on from that domestic yarn production and knowing where our yarn comes from is becoming increasingly more important for knitters so talk about that what's your thoughts on that topic as well as the related topics of um, handmade and slow fashion I think just like with our food and really any industry, the more questions we ask, the more transparency companies are going to have. And I think that's really important. And you can already see how that's shifted some things. So there's companies like Oval and Tannis Fiber Arts that have found more eco-friendly ways to superwash their yarn. You know, if we show that there's something we want or need, then there are going to be companies that can help us fill that need and that care. And I think that's really, really cool. Um, so I I think asking questions and showing that there's that we have an opinion is really important instead of just blind, blindly accepting where things might come from. Um, and then slow fashion, it's been interesting watching some of the emotions come out of people in this past Me Made May and um, I think it's a really fascinating topic and for me personally, making my own clothes, just like cooking my own food, it's really given me a sense of who I am and it's also boosted my confidence. So being able to make something that I feel like fits my body and makes me feel good it's completely changes my day. Like if I'm teaching and I'm wearing something I feel really good in, that's going to really change my experience and the experience of people learning from me. And I think more than anything, the coolest part is I have two young children and my husband's a musician and a photographer and I cook and I am starting to sew and I knit and I think about us passing on these amazing skills to our kids to also help them have confidence and to learn these tactile skills. I just think it's really cool. Like what an awesome life we're living that this can still be precious and that we can still make space for it in a time when our world is turning more and more, um, you know, technical and yeah, I just think it's, I think it's really cool. And it's also a great entertainment for the family if you're doing things yeah. together. You can spend a whole day crafting yeah. or, or baking or, yeah. It brings you together and, yeah, I, that's just really neat to me. And already seeing my young children, like my three-year-old, her dexterity already being built and the pride that you see come on their face when they've created something. I mean, it's really neat. And I think we still feel that as adults when we create something. We're like, this is so cool. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's magical. Well, you're going to show us um, in more detail some of your creations, aren't you? And yeah. also you'll find the fade shawl. I think you're going to give us some info on if we want to do one, how we can combine colours and play with colours. So, yeah, let's have a look. Okay, so we're going to start with some of my faded designs. The original was the Find Your Fade Shawl, which is seven colors faded together. Um, I used hedgehog fibers for this shawl, and the inspiration for it came after I had had my son, and I needed to fill back up. And so I just rearranged my stash and grabbed whatever I wanted to knit with, and laid them out and it was this really beautiful gradient going from yellow to kind of this deep pink and I just decided to try a new shawl shape I hadn't tried before and I just went with it I called it my creativity experiment and um, that is how find your fade was born and so it's really neat it increases on the edges while decreasing in the center to make this really neat triangle shape and then this spring came the so faded sweaters and I'll remove this so you can see. Um, there's a cropped version, and then this is also the long version. 
And again, it's just this method of blending colors together and you kind of pick out your gradient beforehand. It's a great beginner sweater because it's top down, so you can try it on as you go. Really simple raglan shaping. It has a nice little garter detail on the shoulders. Um, but it's also, because it's top down, it's really adaptable to your own personal style. So you can do the cropped version with a shorter sleeve. Some people have even done cap sleeves. Um, or you can do long sleeve and and a longer body and it comes in both adult and child sizes. Um, so I just wanted to show quickly kind of how I pick colors for something like this and what you want to do, I have a couple different gradient sets here from some of my favorite indie dyers. So this is the prism set from Nicole um, from Hugh Loco. And what she's doing, I'll kind of hold these up, but what you want to look for is some nuances that match throughout your gradient. So coming from here, we have some nice little pink speckles to start with. And then we move into this pink and purple where there's still those kind of pink speckles carry over, but now there's some purple as well. And then we move into this blue skein that has the purple and blue and then a green that has the blue, but not with green, and then finally adding um, kind of a green and yellow. And so carrying the speckle over one from the beginning over helps them all look really cohesive in your final fade. I also think um, the more colors, the better. So if you're a sock knitter or you just love collecting sock yarn, then using your stash, like just using little bits, it can just be a few rows and it still looks really, really beautiful, which is why I find your fade had so many colors because that made the co most cohesive fade. That's not to say you can't use three colors if you want, but I probably wouldn't go below that. So this is another really pretty fade from Kindred Red. And again, it's looking for those nuances that match from skein to skein so that you can move. Um, you know, this moves from kind of a blue to a yellow green at the end. Um, but there's every skein next to the other one has a little bit of that nuance from the previous. And a way to really tell um, what those nuances might be is actually to go ahead and unskein and then really spread that out on the ground so that you can see all those differences in there. And then if you have all of them laid out like that, it's really easier to tell like, okay, yeah, there's a good flow in this. This is going to be a beautiful gradient all knit up. And then obviously a swatch is always really helpful. So that's the so faded pattern and find your fade. That's great. You know, I'm not really into speckled yarns, but that makes me want to get into speckled yarn. Yeah. <laughs> right, good. A lot because, of people say that. They're like, yeah, I just didn't know how to use them or if I liked them. <laughs> yeah, but I can see that. And I think it's an excellent idea for a, somebody to get into a jumper and immediately have color work. Yeah. You know, with all they have to do is learn the style of, of a good stockingette, raglan jumper, that's enough, and then they can explore yeah. and have fun and not get bored because the, the colours are changing all the time, and to as a stash buster, right. definitely. Right, and it's engaging. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Great. Absolutely. So what else have you got to show us? All right, so next up we have the sheltered poncho, and... This was knit with Brooklyn Tweed's Shelter. Um, I really like that yarn for this because it's, while it's warm and it's a worsted weight, it's so light. So for a bigger piece like this, it doesn't feel too heavy. Um, this is really fun construction because you actually do knit from the bottom up, but it has these rounded hems. And so you use some short row shaping in the front and the back and you knit up and you begin this really neat faux seam um, right here, which might be a little for, far for you to see that detail. But then we move into a nice broken stockinette top to change the look of it, make it a little more modern um, with some more short row shaping. And then we just bind off and then pick up stitches to do a cowl. And this actually has a hood on it, a cute little pointed hood. And at the very end, my favorite tip and trick for this one is to actually wear these where the texture changes. There's these little faux seams. I actually just went through with a little scrap yarn and 
put a few stitches in there and it keeps it closed almost like more of a sleeve and I just find it's a lot easier to wear and a little more flattering um, but this is my favorite fall garment it's, it's just super cute to throw on. yeah thank you thank you and so what what weight yarn is the shelter again worsted worsted yeah 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 great so I love brioche and this shawl is brioche luscious and it is just a mix of some short row stripes with a little bit of seed stitch texture and then I go into a couple brioche bands and what I love about this shawl is it's a great way to play with color and if you are new to speckles or a variegated yarn texture like brioche or garter or seed stitch really helps break up the way that those are dyed and so it's a great way to get used to using those kinds of yarns if maybe you're a little intimidated by them so with the garter stripes and then these different texture sections it really plays with that yarn in a beautiful way and then my favorite part of this shawl is the applied brioche border which is this really beautiful rickrack edge which is actually just created using increasing and decreasing and so you knit this this is a crescent shaped shawl and then this is actually knit sideways and as you knit this band it effectively binds off the entire border of your shawl so it's really neat and it is the crescent shape just makes it want to hug your shoulders it's really easy to wear and um, one of my all-time favorites I wear this pretty much anytime I travel <laughs> I love the choice of color there I love mustard and green together yeah. yeah me too me too yeah and I can see that that's a really good one for beginners because you get the relief of garter stitch yeah it's great to have a mixture for the last one I'd like to show everyone today this is the yoga shawl um, it's a big rectangle with a really beautiful chevron edge this was knit out of Brooklyn Tweed's loft and what's really neat about this shawl is there's so many different ways to wear it because there's buttonholes along the length of it and then along the bottom edge of it so that you can button it in all sorts of ways to wear it and I thought it would be fun to show you my favorite way so what you'd want to do is you would want to basically make a giant cowl out of it so you're gonna button the two long edges together but only about halfway so you can see I'm keeping the bottom open so then you place one of those peaks so it makes kind of a triangle shawl shape right in front and then you take this extra length and loop it once and put it over your head and then you kind of adjust it until it feels comfortable for you into a big cozy cowl so it almost is a mix between a cowl and a triangle scarf but that's my favorite way to wear it and then when knit out of loft again it's that woolen spun yarn so it's really nice and light even though it's a large piece and you can also wear this as a poncho and just as a stole all different kinds of ways it looks like a really buffy cloud yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a, yeah. a squishy cloud around your neck uh -huh. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for showing us your work and, and yeah, how you go about it and telling us the background and particularly the Fade, Find Your Fade series. That was really interesting. It's great to know you a little bit better and to have you on the podcast. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was really fun. Okay, we'll say goodbye to the audience now. Bye. Bye.
Hello. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, wait. <laughs> you can be uh, relaxed. Okay. Yeah. This is our lovely daughter, Madeline. She occasionally joins us on the show. Welcome, Madeline. Lovely to have you.